Welcome everybody as you're coming in. Uh, just a quick reminder that we are here for catalogers organizing locally and uh, there is another session happening in uh, track two if you're looking for that one. Um, but we will get started in just a couple minutes here. Thanks again to our sponsors Mobius and the Evergreen Community Development Initiative. Uh, for their sponsorship of the platform and of our closed captioning. And I will put our captioning link in the chat here. And I've developed a cough in the last 10 minutes, so I'll go, I'll mute myself a lot, I'm afraid. <laughs> Working on it. <clears throat> I think it's too dry here. Well, Rosalind has not been bothering me today, so I hopefully we'll not have her in the middle of this session as well. Well, you just said that out loud, so she'll be that's true. She'll be there anytime now. Mikey's in here with me, but he's mm -hmm. been leaving me alone. Yeah, so far I've, I've not been interrupted, but it's always as things get started, he'll show mm -hmm. up. My husband cleverly named our cat Mr. Kitty. So, oh. so when I talk about Mr. Kitty and people say, what's his name? I'm like, no, that, that's his name, Mr. <laughs> Kitty. <clears throat> he answers to it. I have one cat that knows her name and you just have to say fig and she'll like pause because she's waiting for you to tell her what to do or not do. Mm -hmm. Or decide if she's going to ignore you or not. Very quiet cat. Mm -hmm. I think I'll go ahead and share our screen here before I forget. Wait, Jason, you know someone whose dog is Mr. Kitty? See, that's just <laughs> most of the people right there. <laughs> and Red, I think Miss Kitty would have been nice too. But... That was a character off of Gunsmoke. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The beauty mark right there. Mm -hmm. All righty, let me go ahead and share this if I can. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming and hanging out with us. Today, we have J. Elaine Hardy, Jessica. Oh, Jessica, I should have asked how to pronounce your <laughs> last name before I got to it. I apologize. Will you say Fill it for me? Filia. Filia. Fill Fill OK. J. Elaine Hardy, Jessica Filial, Janet Schrader, and Jennifer Weston. And they're going to talk to us about catalogers organizing locally. I hope you all enjoy the presentation. And I'll say we're all going to introduce ourselves again one more time, but I will point out we all have J as our first initials. Even though Elaine doesn't use hers, we're still the J ladies today. <laughs> uh -huh. That's true. So there's power in that. Uh -huh. So we'll get started here. We go. So we'll just start with introductions. Um, very quickly, I'm Jennifer Weston. I'm the Network at Equinox Open Library Initiative. You might know me from facilitating monthly evergreen cataloging working group meetings. All of us are part of the cataloging working group. We're all part of the organizing committee. So thank you for being here. And I'll turn over introductions to the panel. That's you, Elaine. Oh, OK. I was, I was just saying, do you want me to go next? Yeah, we'll um, go right down the list. Uh, my first name is Jill. My father's name was Jack. I thought it was a cruel joke. Um, <laughs> anyway. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, I'm the Pines and Collaborative Projects Manager with the Georgia Public Library Service, participated in developing Evergreen, um, and I've been to almost every conference, I think. I'm Jessica Filial. I'm the Technical Services Supervisor at the Jackson County Public Library. We're a, an NC Cardinal library, and I am a member of the NC Cardinal Cataloging Committee, um, and I got to know Jennifer when she on it way back when. Good times. Hi, I'm Janet Schrader. I'm the Bibliographic Service Supervisor at the CW Mars Network in Massachusetts, um, which is a consortium of over 150 libraries. Well, thanks. These will move on to our first question for the panel. Just to let you uh, all know kind of the structure for today, we've got a few questions we're going to pose to the panel to, to kind of ask to tell us more about their libraries and how about how the cataloging um, infrastructure works there. And after we get through with this, we've allowed quite a bit of time for question and answer session too. So if you've got questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. I'll monitor those. We will answer them as we go along, but then we'll also have time at the end. 
So first question for all of you, how are cataloging activities structured in your libraries? Do you have centralized or dispersed cataloging? Um, I'll go first since my name's first on the list. <laughs> um, we have dispersed cataloging. Uh, cataloging is, res is responsibility of each library system. Um, our, uh, Georgia's libraries are, divide, are uh, primarily multi-system um, libraries. We have like 169, 159 counties in the state, but we have 53, I think now. We've had some mergers recently, um, systems, um, and not all of which are in Pines. Um, so uh, each each library is responsible for their own cataloging. We do some, um, occasionally we'll do uh, like original for people, although our cataloging coordinator, Ben Lynn, does a lot of original for people. Um, but for the most part, they're responsible for their own. So just to follow up there, Lane, so you have somebody that's that serves, well, talk a little more about Ben's role, Ben Lynn's role there. Does she, is she uh, there as a centralized person contact? She, you? She, well, she is, she's one of the Pine staff. She mm -hmm. does the uh, training for our Cat One catalogers um, in the, it, and then she, and other, and tr training for original in OCLC. Um, and she assists uh, libraries when they need original for specific materials. Like now she's working in a project with one library to catalog toys. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then if we're going down the line, that's you, Jessica. Okay, I'll go next. Um, North Carolina Cardinal is also non-centralized for cataloging, um, but and so is also my local library system. Um, Jackson County Public Library, where I am physically is part of our three county regional library system. Um, everybody does their own cataloging. Um, uh, at the time that we migrated to Evergreen in um, 2012, my local library system had a cataloging and technical services CATS committee, but it really was always more about processing than anything else. Um, and, and since the Cardinal Cataloging Committee um, has really taken off and gotten up to speed, um, thank you so much, April Durrance, who's our facilitator. Um, you know, we, um, at the very local level, have have effectively disbanded anything having to do with <laughs> cataloging because the the consortial committee is really giving us the guidance um, you know that we need. Um, and the cardinal cataloging committee, made up of um, representatives from member libraries, you know, it has. Uh, taken on projects like um, some documentation and best practices in order to address the same kind of problems that um, Jonathan Moore of um, the SPARC Consortium addressed in his presentation yesterday. So um, we're still a um, kind of distributed environment, but um, the consortial committee plays a super important role in that's all on the same page. It's interesting that as a regional library, you were able to, to just then learn, pivot to start just relying on the on the Cardinal Cataloging Committee as support, as opposed to having to have your separate regional. Yes. We, yeah, yeah. We'd started out at one time in our region, um, local catalogers, uh, did copy cataloging and any original cataloging went to the headquarters person, but that that just diminished and diminished and diminished over the years and we abandoned it completely. <laughs> it's good to, to evolve. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> good social work is beautiful. Okay, Janet, CW Mars. Okay, well, we... We have, we have uh, centralized cataloging for adding records to the database. Uh, library uh, staff and member libraries send in requests uh, for what records they need. And we have one full-time staff person and one part-time staff per person that search OCLC and export those records. We have one 
part-time cataloger that creates original records at the request of the member libraries. We do have uh, about we have do, do have 29 libraries that are currently using Cat Express that are that can search OCLC and download records. But when they create that daily file of records when it's loaded, um, we, mod we monitor the records that come in so that we can reject anything that um, is not a full level record from OCLC. So the, uh, we have uh, two large libraries, Worcester and Springfield, that are the second and third largest cities in Massachusetts and they are full OCLC members so they they can also uh, use Z39.50 to import records as well as the academic libraries that are full OCLC members. So we don't do centralized cataloging as far as cataloging the I items. The libraries do that um, but they do it with the records that we have loaded for them. Okay, it sounds like we've got a, a variety of different structures there, but all with some level of support, whether it's with a full-time person or, or a committee there. It's just a little bit of variances there. Right, and the, the um, person, the, the cataloger we have, she's been working remotely since last um, March. So she's been working remotely for 14 months now. Wow. And because we cannot send the, well, we let libraries send the physical items to us uh, when our office was open. Hmm. And, you know, we would, she would do the cataloging from the actual items. So once the office closed, um, we had to depend on scans for original cataloging. So, um, if we had physical items here, I would scan them and send them to her. If we encourage the libraries to do their own scanning, to send us the sets of scans, um, we have extensive direction um, instructions on our staff website as to what they needed to include when they sent the scans. And I would say most most of the libraries are following, the, you know, that. Um, the rules for that and sending the appropriate scans. Um, occasionally we mail, you know, photocopies to her, but we've, we've, <laughs> we've sort of adjusted to... I was going to say, it was quite an adjustment. Mm -hmm. yeah. 14 months later, you've got a great process in place. Yeah. <laughs> That's not one of the questions we had here, but is how do you handle when you have to catalog from home? But yeah, that sounds like you worked through that. Right. The people, the, the staff that work from home, well, everyone was working remotely. Um, and it, it, so the CAT Center staff, uh, we were, we uh, each came in one day a week. Mm. And the other days uh, was working remotely. And I would say they, had, the two people that, you know, that do this, um, you know, searching OCLC and that, they had all types of systems, you know, the, because they're not in the office together and they print out the requests that come in. Mm -hmm. So they set it up. So one of them prints out four requests and the next four requests that come in, the next, the other person prints out those four requests. Cause I often wondered why, you know, they, we work through a system of email. So anytime a request comes in, the staff member that printed it out would then send an email with the, you know, that would put printed in the mm -hmm. subject line so that there was no duplication of what got printed. Yeah. And I often wondered why the printed emails always came in like <laughs> groups of three or four. And yeah. it's because that's how they set up their procedures their to flow. work remotely. Mm -hmm. ah. So before we move on, I just want to ask, because Elaine, I know that um, your catalogers catalog directly in OCLC, right? Um, well, we use a Z39.50 um, interface to bring a record in from OCLC and we create any record that's created is created in OCLC. We don't, except for things that are ephemeral, mm -hmm. uh, we don't create records within the Pines database. <clears throat> we are lucky that um, GPLS pays for yeah. statewide cataloging and interlibrary loan with OCLC for Pines and non-Pines library. Mm -hmm. So um, everyone has access 
to that. Um, and, you know, it's in, it helps our database. It prevents duplicates. Only one place to go. The only batch loading we do is for um, acquisitions. And then those records have to be replaced by, you know, an OCLC record, and then they have to be brought in one at a time. Okay. Cool. And uh, Janet, we're getting a note here that if there's a little bit of echo coming off of your microphone. I don't know if there's anything we can do about that, well, but I'll leave that there. But I was going to ask you anyway, you said that you had a, you also um, have an OCLC subscription, so you get records directly from OCLC as well, correct? Yes, we only use OCLC records. Um, we made that a, I mean, that's been our policy since 1996. So you're lucky enough to still have funding for OCLC then? Yes, and the libraries that we're using CAD Express, we're using CAD Express as prepaid records. Mm -hmm. And this year, for the first time, we migrated those libraries to use our network subscription also, so they no longer have to pay for CAD Express records. Oh, and I logged, so OCLC created, you know, all the logins for them. And I logged in with each login and set them up so they can only see the Express tab in the connection browser. And I mean, they actually have full permission, cataloging permissions in OCLC, but they don't know it. Yeah. So, well, I don't think anyone has discovered that they yet. They do now, Jen. Well, they're probably now, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, we'll, have we'll, we'll cut that out of the recording. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but if they were here. <laughs> yes, I think there are a couple here. I noticed the names going by, um, but they... They are set up to use Cat Express exactly the way they were using it. They were using it before, except now they now they no longer have their own symbol in OCLC, and they're all actually saving money by using it using oh, our really subscription. Cool. Well, well, our yes, yeah, each just, of our libraries have their own symbols, and some but uh, one has two. Mm -hmm. so. I think it's a little different in NC Cardinal than Jessica. Yeah, that's been an an issue because only a few member libraries are OCLC libraries. Um, and so it's been in, important for, you know, the standards that the cataloging committee is setting. Um, it's important for us to sort of um, not, not cause problems for those of us who are OCLC members and also educate the rest of the consortium about how um, how that, you know, how you need to protect <laughs> your OCLC records for right. those libraries that, that use them. <laughs> so that's been something that we've had to address at the consortial level. Absolutely. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next question. I know that I had a lot of follow-ups there, but we'll keep going. Um, Sorry to answer this question a little, I know, but we'll just specifically ask um, about your cataloging committees. Uh, Talk a little bit more about how they operate in terms of governance and how often you meet and kind of the the scope of the work that has been taken on by your cataloging committee. Um, Pines has a cataloging committee, a cataloging subcommittee, which means it's a subcommittee of the executive uh, committee that uh, governs Pines, the consortium. Um, it doesn't, at one time it met fairly re frequently and had a little bit to do with governance, but um, now I think we just, okay, if we need to add a new CERC modifier, for example, we run it by them first. <clears throat> I've got a new policy. I want to I want to have a tighter policy on graphic novels and multi-volume works in specific. So I'm running that by them. Um, so there are things, just special things that we do, but anything that like the circulation modifiers have to have final approval of the executive committee. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that they just vote on and tell the sub uh, executive committee, we prefer this for this reason. Um, and then the executive committee either approves it or doesn't approve it. So we're not really in, um, you know, for the, some, for some things we get to set policy from the pint, you know, Ben and I, and for other things we have to go through the executive committee. Uh, but the cataloging committee doesn't is not really very active. Okay, but you have a, a workflow if changes are needed yeah. or requested. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Well, in um, in Cardinal, the Cardinal Governance Committee specifies some details of how the various working committees um, should be formed, but um, then you know just sort of lets us lets us go. <laughs> um, uh, so the Cardinal Cataloging Committee, and by the way, I'm relying on um, some great background from April for this. Um, but uh, uh, members of the committee are, are submitted by nomination um, and uh, have to be approved by their library directors and the consortium and the, the committee tries to get representation from different kinds of libraries, um, different sizes and all around the state and some representation from regional library entities um, municipals and county libraries, so that you know those different structures, as they might affect cataloging procedures, you know, are represented. Um, um, there are between maybe five and eight um, people who make up the cataloging committee, um, and we're we're sort of more of um, we we create cataloging policy, uh, but in many ways, it's a more um, strong advisory type body. <laughs> um, and it doesn't wrap back into true governance issues, um, in the way that, you know, perhaps might be the case you know, in, other, in other models. Um, we meet, you know, we're sort of project based at this point and depending on what the projects are that we're working on that will dictate our meeting frequency but um, you know every month every other month um, we try to meet and of course the COVID era <laughs> has meant that we do a lot of communicating over base camp um, which is useful and of course that'll continue but it's a model that um, you know, really seems to work. It seems to work for the for the tasks that we feel like we need to be doing. It's a um, it's a pretty good structure. It's got enough flexibility, I think, to um, to let us be effective. <laughs> and it's been in place for quite a few years now, too, hasn't it? Yes. I don't remember how far back it goes, but a while. <laughs> yes. Well, I April. I can't believe it's been four years since you. And facilitator. Yeah, that's fabulous. All right, Janet. Uh, we have a bibliographic committee that operates very similar to what Elaine and Jessica said. Um, currently, we have 13 members, uh, 13 members, I want to say 12 members plus me, so I don't have to say it's a group of 13. <laughs> 12 members plus me. And uh, we tend to meet about twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall, unless we have a special project that we're working on. So ours is sort of project oriented also, mm -hmm. where something comes up and the committee needs to um, develop a best practices or a policy. Uh, at the start of the pandemic last spring, we, we met to revise our policy for adding online resource records because it basically said that our network would add online resources at the request of member libraries. And so we now have a much more detailed policy for different types of online resources, such as OverDrive Advantage titles or EBSCO databases or databases like um, Freeding. And this, uh, well, uh, the other project we're working on is going to come up later when we get to the like, question four. Um, but let's see. Our members are volunteers, and we also, we like Jessica, we try to get members that represent different size libraries or different um, geographic areas. We're very spread out over Massachusetts, and it was very difficult to find a central place where someone wasn't driving for close to two hours to attend a meeting. So 
I have to say that <laughs> the pandemic was extremely helpful <laughs> in how our committee met mm -hmm. because once we start once we met on Zoom, um, the attendance was really good because there was no travel involved and you know people could take uh, you know an hour and a half or so to attend a meeting um, even you know during their work day because they didn't have to spend an additional two hours to do a round trip um, drive to get to a library. So we have developed uh, policy, best practice policies uh, for the libraries uh, for things such as adding Library of Things uh, records to the database or whether we have a policy about using um, the same record for, uh, I'm sorry, we have a policy for using serial records, that's a network policy mm -hmm. developed by the committee, and we have a best practices um, document for adding um, paperback, you know, trade paperbacks to the same record as the hardcover. So we, you know, we try to do our best. Sounds like, it sounds like COVID, it, in some ways, when you prove that you can operate from a Zoom call, you never want to go back. It's I know. <laughs> suddenly that drive just seems to feel like you could spend your time better elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, you enjoy the drive and you enjoy the fact that after the meeting, you can go out to lunch or, sure. you know, it, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's something to be but, said for that in-person camaraderie, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah. still get a lot done <laughs> online. <laughs> Before we move on, I just want to share Elizabeth Thompson's with us in the chat. Is also a member of the organizing committee for the cataloging working group, the Evergreen. She's just is sharing that Noble has an electronic resources and database working group. I like that name that we work with for policy issues and decisions on things, just like many of you were talking about loading records for e electronic resources, catalog screen changes, that kind of thing that would affect all the libraries. Their members include, this is interesting, catalogers, public services staff and administrators. So that's a little different than, hmm. than the others that it, it goes beyond the purview of just cataloging. That's fascinating. So if others are in chat want to share how you are organized locally, please do. And we will talk about you too in a positive way. I, I, forgot, to <laughs> me I forgot to mention that like um, Jessica, the any policy that we write does have to be approved by our executive committee. And it sounds like Elaine, they do that in, in Pines too. Yeah, for the, it depends on the policy. Okay. Um, and I did forget at their, they are um, nominated by their, by the, um, their directors, mm -hmm. and then um, the executive committee votes on their inclusion. And I don't know of any time when somebody has not been, they've been nominated by their director for any of our subcommittees that they have not been approved yeah. by the executive committee. I think there's something to be said for having that director being the one to nominate them to. Yeah. Because yeah. there also has to be approval of being able to spend that kind of time because these committees are volunteer and they take up, you know, they need a commitment to, so, mm -hmm. to make sure that you've got support from, from the administration and directors to, to do that. Okay, let's move on to question three. Talk a little about any, your cataloger training program and the kinds of resources that are made available to the catalogers. And how that might be evolving in the last year. <laughs> <laughs> um, we ha we uh, if you're going to be a Cat One, um, and this dates to before you know from the original formation of Pines, uh, you have to be trained by um, the cataloging coordinator, which is currently and has been for some time, Ben Lynn. Um, she trains them on you know OCLC, um, what a mark record is, and things like that. Um, our cat, the cat two's responsibility for training is with the library, since those are local. Um, they do that the item level records. Cat twos can't do any kind of. Uh, they can't bring in a record. They can't um, uh, edit a record. They just handle the volume and item uh, part of the record. Um, Although there are times when, like, I have to train a cat two person because maybe there isn't anybody in there. <laughs> They're going to be a cat one because they only had one cataloger and they left. And uh, so they need to have training um, to add those items to existing records before um, Ben can do the cataloging. And a lot of, you know, with COVID, a lot of her cattle, that the training has moved online. And I think she gets a lot more um, participation 
in um, that when she announces that she's doing one uh, for her original. And she also trains for original cataloging in OCLC. Um, we provide, uh, in addition to the OCLC subscription, which we have been providing at least, a, well, initially it was just to Pines Libraries, since I want to say 2000, 2001, um, maybe a little later, we were, I think, one of the first statewide consortiums in OCLC had to, originally they wanted to charge us for every library in Pines every time a record was brought in. Whoa. Uh, so that had to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. um, we also offer a subscription to RDA Toolkit to all libraries to web dewey uh, and to uh for those that need you know they do original for to catalogers desktop and there's just really a handful of, of people who are that um but the all of the, you know we required them to have the print acr2 and um the print uh, ddc schedules so once it went online we started providing the uh the subscriptions for that um, and uh, of course there's all the you know we we're um, cre i'm incredibly fortunate that our the leadership at gpls sees the value in having trained catalogers and giving them the resources that they need to do that and that we have the money because it's um mm -hmm. oclc is not cheap mm -hmm. and it is phenomenal they continue to support mm -hmm. you in, in the way that is so beneficial. Let me ask about RDA Toolkit. Do you have just the one subscription or do you have multiples for the various? We libraries? have multiple. We had um, the way it's structured. We have to have we have one for each um, library and then some libraries might have multiple uh, subs uh, their license might allow them to have multiple simultaneous logins. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a subscription for each one. And that's not it, we get it at a reduced rate. Mm -hmm. It's still kind of pricey, but not as bad as OCLC. Nope. <laughs> no. Cardinal tried, um, Cardinal did offer a subscription to RDA Toolkit for a bit, but I, it didn't really, it wasn't, it wasn't widely used. Um, and so, you know, it, it discontinued. I think, frankly, I, people, I don't, a lot of people weren't used to having a resource like that. <laughs> where right. kind of, used mm -hmm. to being resource starved um and that's and in fact that's um you know colored a lot of the way we need, we need to, to work and the training that we mm -hmm. need to provide well like i said we we require them to have um access to those resources mm -hmm. so um we started buying the print before you know they quit printing and before we moved to rda uh, the pr print versions um and now so now we provide the um the electronic versions and i you know i'm, I'm frankly it probably doesn't get used as much as i would like for it to be used um but it is there as a resource for them um right. in case they could case they do need, need it well, in my experience with the RDA toolkit is I almost feel like there needs to be a training program for how to use the RDA toolkit. Yes. Well, we have had that actually. We, yeah, I was um, going to ask, a, have you done that? Yeah, we did. Um, I do. A, I want to do it every year, but I have to do it every other year. Mm -hmm. A um, conference for all the catalog, public library catalogers in the state. Last year, we also did USG um, University System of Georgia institutions. Mm -hmm. and um, But a, a couple of years ago, we've had two um, of conferences where Library of Congress folks came down and trained us on um, RDA and on using the toolkit. Of course, it's, you know, change into the new RDA, which I really am saying retirement date approaching with this one. <laughs> um, I'm taking a course right now and I'm pulling my hair out trying to figure out what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, um, so they have had some training in using it. That's what, that was the joke. But who was it when RDA first, that RDA was retirement dead ahead? <laughs> yeah. RDA. <laughs> yeah, and well, I've, I heard retirement date approaching. There you go. That's what I <laughs> okay, um, who else wants to talk about cataloger training program? Cardinal um, does have 
does have training, um, but it, it's, it's couched, it, it's um, sort of framed slightly differently. Um, it, is, it is framed as um, how to, uh, to be familiar with and use the cataloging best practices that have been developed. Um, you know, so that's been a that's been a project going back several years, slowly developing the um, consortial standards and best practices. And as part of that, um, uh, changing the permission structure a little bit. So so there are two cataloging permission levels. You can be an item cataloger um, who can attach items but cannot make any changes to a bib record or you can be a bibliographic cataloger with full permission to do whatever needs to be done with a bib record, including bringing in new ones, creating original ones, um, all of that. So with, with um, the changes in the permissions and the development of the procedures and practices, um, we, needed, we needed all of, our existing catalogers to get training on what those new standards are. You know, for many people, it wouldn't be uh, new information for them, but others, depending on what their knowledge level and workflow was, it might have been a you know a big a big thing. Um, so we created um, as a committee um, a, a set of best practices. Um, and did in, some in-person training, uh, recorded in-person trainings throughout the state so people could come to the, um, you know, the location that worked best for them. We um, uh, hired a contractor to, to offer those trainings uh, and, you know, committee worked with her to make sure that it was not only a general cataloging course, but a cataloging in Evergreen <laughs> course. Right. Um, and those materials, um, you know, were recorded and, and have remained available. And so those formed the basis for preparing all catalogers in the consortium to pass an assessment, um, not a test, <laughs> but a, a skills assessment um, that uh, matched which level they they needed, um, the item level or the bibliographic level, um, and it it has it has served really well, I think, as a general training tool for new catalogers. Um, I've trained a couple of people now, really just based on the foundation and the architecture of. Um, the cardinal best practices document, and it's been it's been great. We I, yeah. my library system does not have any other formal training program for catalogers other than um, what the consortial committee came up with. So it's been really helpful in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, I was looking at um, Lene here was talking about being part of Spark in the chat. They have access to an online knowledge book through Spark support. And I feel like each of your libraries, um, especially in C Cardinal, I'm familiar with, you have an online knowledge book as well. Yes. Um, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but that sounds familiar. Knowledge book. I can. Well, and we have a wiki. To it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's what? It's supported by, hosted on HelpSpot, okay. which is also the um, help ticket platform. So it's sort of all together and all of the all of the documents are there. Um, not just cataloging, but resource sharing and <clears throat> governance and lots of things. Yeah. And Elaine, yes. you just shared yours too. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot to mention that. It's um it is a constant work in progress because it has to be I, there's still things I've got to update and add. Yeah. Um, and I'm not I'm not as well versed with uh, DocuWiki as I would like, so I'm sure there. If I, I'm sure I could organize it better if I could figure out how to do it. <laughs> the important thing is making it available. 
Yeah, that's, yeah. That's what I always say. I feel the same way about a DocuWiki, but just having it there. Thanks for sharing both of those. Okay, Janet. Well, we have a lot of uh, online documentation uh, for our catalogers, but we don't have a formal um, cataloger training program. We do one-on-one -on -one training with libraries, um, new libraries as they join the consortium. And we also do one-on-one -on -one training if a library gets a new cataloger and they, or, or if they have a cataloger that is asking for a refresher course in, you know, using Evergreen. Uh, none of our catalogers are creating full level records because we just use, we only use the OCLC records but they are creating brief records um, for things that would not have an OCLC record. And so we have multiple templates that they can use. And the templates are like pre-populated um, with information that would always be in a record for that format. So if they use the template for to add a, a record for a DVD because they need to circulate it before you know, they, they can get a record from us. Um, the physical information is already filled in that says, you know, like one video disc uh, in the, you know, sound, color, four and three quarter inches. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Uh, the catalogers send, you know, when they send their, their request to us, they're filling out an online form and it's a Google form. When they fill in the information in the form and click submit, it's automatically emailed to us. Um, we also have forms for reporting duplicate records or requesting overlays. So um, we keep up with some database maintenance that way. Uh, our network is, well, I wanna say if there's any of our network here, <laughs> We are all about standardization. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We we allow libraries to attach items to periodicals, and because we're only using serial records for things like a serial record for an almanac or a travel guide, mm -hmm. so we have standards on what those parts would, what those monograph parts would be. Uh, we went through a very large project, you know, just over a year ago cleaning up all the parts or periodicals that were not entered according to our standard format. Wow. And <laughs> I have to project, say that, I'm sure. <laughs> well, there's been a lot of slip sliding as time progressed and people have not, you know, because we have discovered that the people that are adding the magazine, you know, issues to the record are not necessarily catalogers. And so when we do our cataloging training or when they're reading the, you know, the, in, the documentation online, they're not necessarily seeing what these standard parts should be. So uh, occasionally we have to t contact a library and let them know, you know, that please remind people cataloging magazines what the standardized parts are for adding a you know, weekly issue or a monthly issue. Um, so as I you know, as I said, we have, um, you know, we have a lot of online documentation. It is not, um, I can't give you a link to a manual like Elaine or uh, Jessica did because ours is, you know, just on our, on, you know, on the um, staff, uh, library staff website as individual documents. Uh, we, we do uh, have libraries that subscribe to Web Dewey. They pay their own annual subscription for subscribing. And currently we have uh, 14 libraries that subscribe and we're going to have 15 uh, next month. We have one other library that asks to join. The, we do all, you know, as I said, we do all the original cataloging. So we're not basically training, you know, library staff to create um, record using RDA. Mm -hmm. And we haven't switched over our brief bib templates to have the RDA fields in them either. Um, I, when RDA first started, I thought adding those fields would be a little scary, <laughs> you know, to people, 
You don't know what they were and why, right. you know, why was there something like that in the record? Were they, what were they supposed to do with it? Um, yeah, and then you find out some of them are just standard. Well, most of, I mean, for the, you know, for print and, you know, um, audio book and that, yes, they're all standard. They're all the same. To so ease people into it. Yeah. And the, you know, as a, because we have such a variety in libraries, you know, as I said, we had the um, second largest city in Massachusetts, which has over 185,000 people. Um, we also have towns with a population, populations of under 400. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a there's like it's a, a wide range, wide range of experience as to um, you know what uh, you know whether they're familiar with what the mark record looks like you know what what uh, but they're basically doing copy cataloging so I was very interested mm -hmm. in that program from Spark that had the uh, permission levels, uh, you know, the three um, levels for catalogers were based, you know, the lowest one having only permission to add items. Yep. And I thought, uh, I'm going to look into, you know, doing something like that here because I think it, you know, it would be um, good to have more granular permissions for the, for the staff in the libraries and have some some actual training. I think um, having online training, which we found worked quite well um, in the past year uh, for libraries before they can actually progress on. I have one library that every time they create a brief record, they send me the TCN and they ask me to review it. And I always write back and say, would you like to come and work here because your records are so good? <laughs> There you go. And then well, someone else will create a record and, you know, I won't say it's terrible. I will just, you know, it's just like um, they're not really sure how all the fields are, you know, are filled in. And they never ask if I want to review that record. So. <laughs> of course not. Well, that's a good segue into our fourth question then. So what are you working on now and what future projects would you like to see? Um, I've got, we're, I've written up a policy for multi-part works hmm. um, so that we're all, it, it's sort of been in the background, but I want it written down as a policy so that we're all doing the same way. We have far too many people, and when they get that Southern Living Annual recipe, they put it on its own little record instead of putting it on, you know, the serial record. Mm -hmm. um, and also how to treat graphic novels since that's all over the place within OCLC. Um, so we're, you know, they're helping me get that written up. Um, and then um, I have one that I've kind of started to redo our circulation modifiers because they're a combination of content and format. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to have them all content so that um, we don't have to have a new circulation modifier every time a new um, format comes out for audio or, or visual. Um, so, and that will be a really big project because it will require a lot of data work, both on the part of the libraries and on our sysadmin, Chris. So, and um, your policies, oh man, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. So, um, Cardinal has just um, finished an icon cleanup, um, which has been great. And um, the D dupes are a perennial. <laughs> favorite oh yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> ongoing ongoing yes yes yeah. um and um we're about to do uh e-resources what are you doing with e-resources we're trying to figure out how to how to export them clean them up and mm -hmm. readjust them and make that be uh doable on a regular basis so that so that all of the different e-resource consortia within the Cardinal Consortium can keep track of access to those e-resources for their patrons um, and to do it in a way that's that's accurate and and uses the record, you know, correct bib record as well as correct um, timely access. <laughs> Yeah, we don't allow we don't allow e-resource records for things like overdrive and all um 
they're just in our development to try to with uh, RB Digital got cut off at the knees when uh, they merged or were taken over or whatever that strange thing was oh. that happened with Overdrive. Yep. Did. <laughs> okay, we've got just a few minutes left, Janet, but you can tell us about well, your, what things you would like to see. Well, um, one staff person in, in our cataloging center is now working on a project to clean up all the records that say unknown musical format mm. because the records are missing the 007 field or there's an incorrect code in there. And she's attempting, she's tackling this uh, single handedly. And we did have a report that we have uh, 1400 records that need to be edited, you know, to accomplish that. Um, our BIV committee right now is uh, working on or start beginning to work on a project to update the subject headings that are illegal aliens to change them to undocumented immigrants and aliens to non-citizens and so we um, got a quote from backstage on the cost of you know updating the records if we extracted out the records that needed to be changed and creating our local authority records for us. Um, and so the committee is going to meet and decide. One of the things we have to decide is whether we want to keep the illegal alien subject heading in the record or whether we want to replace it. And I have to look into how Evergreen displays subject headings because if there's a way to keep it in the record but not have it um, show up, um, you know, because of a indicator or a subfield in that field, um, that would be a you know a good thing for us to know. There is, in my understanding, you can do it, but I don't know how. I right. know that's that's one of these we've talked. Right. Not, mm -hmm. Yeah, this, I think this yeah. is something that'll be a, a great session to to talk about as you're working through that with the cataloging working group. Right. So yeah, it'll be yeah. Fascinating. So we're going to um, the committee is going to meet next month, and then we're going to meet with our. Um, social justice subcommittee and then you know we'll make a proposal to go to the executive committee to say how you know what we're going to do about these subject headings mm -hmm. uh, the bibliographic committee also had to include um, staff from the uh, state library the state library of massachusetts is a member of cw mars and also staff from the worcester public library because worcester ha worcester is a govdocs repository and of course, many of the GovDocs have subject headings for illegal aliens, and the state library, you know, also has um, state um, government documents on, you know, on those. So um, this is our, this is like our summer project, or yeah. uh, you know, for this year. Mm -hmm. That's a big one, but it's important, and I think you're leading the way. That I think libraries will be following you. Yeah. Yeah. I see what we're right at time, but there was one question for you, Jessica, about what did your icon cleanup project look like? Yes, um, April also provided um, a, in the chat a link to, um, oh, nice. to Blake's presentation from a couple years ago on the wave cleanup. Um, uh, it was it, searching records for um, for clues as to as to their type. Um, uh, if if it was missing from the fixed fields that create the icon, mm -hmm. using those um, other places in the record where you can reliably detect um, what the item, what the type is, um, uh, matching up those icons, so adding them where they were missing, and then of course, you know, automating that project as much as possible, but creating a um, list of exceptions that need human cataloger eyes <laughs> to make judgments about. Sure. Yeah, that's a huge project. And being able to automate it, and it, was, it was fascinating, too, because we could tell people how to do them individually. But that's fantastic. Right. Well, we could talk for hours anytime we get together. But I want to thank all three of you for being here today. I'm going to back up to our first list here because the emails for these knowledgeable veterans from the cataloging working group <laughs> organizing committee who are 
generously taking their time to talk about how they're structured locally. All their emails are there. So if you have more questions to them, I'm just going to suggest that, you know, they're always available to, well, they're always willing to answer questions available. Just, you know, everybody's available on their own schedules, but they're always very responsive. And I've found that to be true for so many in the cataloging committee, but here's another resource for you. I will post the links to the cataloging working group that for the different resources you've shared. Thank you very much. This has been wonderful. I hope those of you in attendance found it to be so. Reach out anytime and please share your resources as you're developing in <laughs> years to come. You know, I want to thank Elaine because in in doing our documentation, you know, for you know various functionalities in cataloging, we I have read yours extensively. Oh, okay. well, I'm glad to be of help. <laughs> yes. And your spine label one was extremely helpful. Yes. Well that was Taryn and Tiffany and I did that mm -hmm. together. Um, it was a very big project. Yeah. And I had a cataloger who told me what, you know, how many rows she had for her spine label, how many columns, and she wanted to print two two sheets of labels, you know, one right after the other, and the second sheet didn't line up. So I'm suspecting yeah. this is because the second sheet doesn't know what the margins are because, mm -hmm. you know, it has to be like two margins there. I, think, I, I thought get, that was a bug. I, I, couldn't, get, I yeah. couldn't get her labels yeah. to line up. And so I wrote back and said, I don't understand because, you know, I only get like three, two thirds of a sheet of labels. And she's, oh, I didn't tell you I was printing in landscape. No, oh, geez. Oh, oh so I once I switched to that, my labels lined up perfectly on the sheet, but not the second sheet. So, yeah, the, yeah, I, I, yeah, I thought there was a bug about that. I haven't had a chance but, to. Yeah, I, I know. I was going to look mm -hmm. into that because I, you know, I, 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 I didn't know that. I did remember that you said that, that mm -hmm. they, you know, that the spine labels should know that if there's a second sheet, then it, it should adjust for the second sheet. All yeah. right. Well, we're being kicked out, and I have another yeah. session to leave. So thanks again. Uh, everyone is welcome to stay. I'm